This is chapter 17, talking about special senses. The first of the special, special senses that we're going to discuss today is olfaction. Um, this is just the sense of smell. Uh, so smell is going to be a chemical sense um, in that it requires chemicals to bind to receptors in order for it to be detected. Um, the human nose is going to contain anywhere between 10 million to 100 million different receptors for various smells or olfaction. Um, and in this, these are all going to be located in the olfactory epithelia, um, uh, which is in the superior part of the nasal cavity. The olfactory epithelium is going to cover the inferior surface of the cribriform plate. Um, this is of the ethmoid bone of the skull, specifically. And it's going to extend along the superior nasal concha. So the receptors for this, for sense of smell, or for olfaction, like we said, are located in the olfactory epithelium in the nose, right here. Uh, you can see it there. And this is going to be a very small area that it takes up. It's less than one square inch of real estate in, in the nasal, in the, na in the nose, um, on that ethmoid bone, um, that it's going to be occupied by our olfactory epithelium. Um, this is found on the superior part of the nasal cavity, and it covers the inferior surface of the cribriform plate and extends along that superior nasal concha. All right, so we can see that here. The olfactory epithelium is going to consist of three main types of cells. We have olfactory receptor cells, supporting cells, and basal cells. So looking at each of these a little bit more closely, we have the olfactory receptor cells are going to be like the big star players in this show. These are going to be the first order neurons of the olfactory pathway. Each olfactory receptor cell um, is a bipolar neuron with an exposed kind of knob shaped dendrite which you can see over here um, and then an axon that's going to project um, through that cribriform plate that ends in the olfactory bulb um, which is the part of the brain that we've discussed before. Um, so extending from the dendrites of an olfactory receptor cell are several of these little non-motile olfactory cilia. And these are going to be the site of olfactory transduction. So within the plasma membrane of the olfactory cilia are going to be olfactory receptor proteins that are there to detect inhaled chemicals. These chemicals that bind to and stimulate the olfactory receptors in these olfactory cilia are called odorants. This is what's responsible for giving things their smell. Basically, it's just chemicals that are sort of aerosolized and floating around. Um, olfactory receptor cells are going to respond to chemical stimulus, stimulation of an odorant molecule by producing a generator potential and therefore initiating the olfactory response. The other types of cells that we have in the olfactory epithelium are the supporting cells, also called columnar epithelium, or which is a type of columnar epithelium, and these are located in the mucous membrane that's lining the nose. These are used for physic to physically support those um, olfactory cells, receptor cells, as well as to nourish and electrically insulate the, the olfactory receptor cells. So this is kind of like your, your support staff. We also then have basal stem cells, and just like any other stem cell, these guys are able to undergo mitosis, and they're going to replace any sort of olfactory receptor cells that are either too old or worn out or have been damaged in any way. Um, so these are there to kind of keep the population strong or are built up. And then last but not least, we have our olfactory glands or our Bowman's glands. And these produce mucus, um, which is kind of gross, I know. Um, but these produce mucus that's going to be used to dissolve odors, uh, odor molecules so that they can um, bind more efficiently to those, um, those olfactory receptor cells. And this is going to make it easier for transduction to occur. So now let's take a look at the actual physiology of olfaction, how it actually works. Olfactory receptor cells are going to react to odorant molecules in pretty much the same way that most of the sensory receptors react to their specific stimuli. A receptor potential is going, or depolarization is going to develop, and this is going to trigger one or more nerve impulses. This whole process is called olfactory transduction, and it occurs in the following sort of order or process. So for starters, we're going to have the binding of an odorant um, to our olfactory receptor protein. 
um, right here. And this is going, which, and these proteins are found in the olfactory cilium. Um, and this is going to stimulate a membrane protein called a G protein, right, which we see down here. Our G protein, in turn, is going to activate some, an enzyme. It's called adenylylcyclase. And this is going to cause adenylylcyclase to produce a substance called cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or cyclic AMP. All right, so our cyclic AMP, this is going to be our secondary messenger. And this cyclic AMP is going to cause um, cation channels to open, right? And this is going to allow for sodium and calcium to enter the cytosol. And this, in turn, is going to cause a depolarizing receptor potential to form in the membrane of those olfactory receptor cells. If that depolarization, depolarization of those olfactory receptor cells reaches threshold, then an action potential is going to be generated, and it's going to propagate along the axons of those olfactory receptor cells. So, overall, olfactory transduction is simply the binding of an odorant molecule to an olfactory receptor protein. This uh, is going to involve a, chemicals, a chemical reaction that involves cyclic AMP, which causes the depolarization of the cell by opening our cation channel and allowing for sodium and calcium to enter the cell. The action potential will then travel um, to the primary olfactory area, and then impulses are going to travel then from there to the frontal lobe, to the orbitofrontal lobe specifically. Um, where odors can be identified and processed. Um, so. so the human nose is very interesting. The human nose contains about 10 million olfactory receptors, sometimes more, um, if you've got one of those really keen senses of smell, and of which there are going to be about 400 different functional types of these olfactory receptors. So each type of olfactory receptor is only going to be able to react to a select group of odorants. So um, only one type of, react of receptor is going to be found at any given olfactory receptor cell. So by this logic, there are 400 or so different types of olfactory receptor cells that are present in the olfactory epithelium, in that less than a square inch of you know, nasal you know, real estate, you've got over 400 different types of olfactory receptor cells. So people have for a long time really tried to see if there's a way to distinguish or classify like the primary sensations of smell, similar to how we would have the primary tastes, like the sweet and the salty, um, the sour, etc. So we've tried to do the same thing for olfaction. However, we've not been overly successful. It's not as simple as all that. Genetic evidence now suggests that the existence of about a hundred or so different primary odors. So our ability to recognize you know, tens of thousands of different odors is probably going to have more to do with our brain's ability to recognize the different patterns um, from the activation of different combinations of olfactory receptor cells than it does from these specific um, from these specific primary sensations. So it's it's just it's re it's more of a pattern recognition thing that's going to give us the ability to recognize and identify as many different smells as we we are. So. Just overall, receptors of the nasal mucosa then are going to send impulses um, up along the branch of branches of the olfactory nerve. So here we can see our olfactory epithelium. If we zoom in, we've got our olfactory epithelium. Um, are going to um, receptor cells. These are going to send impulses um, through the cribriform plate. And they're going to synapse with the, olfact, um, with the olfactory bulbs, parts of the brain there. And that impulse is then going to travel along the olfactory tract, um, which you can see here. Um, and then this is going to be um, interpreted in the primary olfactory area of the cerebral cortex, specifically in the temporal lobe. Um, so olfaction, just like most all of the other special senses, is going to have a very low threshold. So only a few molecules of a certain substance or a specific odorant are going to need to be present in the air in order for it to be perceived as an odor. Um, some things are more potent than others. And a really great example of this is a chemical called methyl mercaptane or beta mercaptoethanol. Um, this is going to smell like stinky rotten cabbage. Um, it's quite pungent, um, and it can be detected it can be detected by nose, like by the nose, in concentrations as low as one twenty-fifth of a billionth of a milligram 
per milliliter of air. So um, basically a drop or two of this, of this particular stuff would be enough to stink up an entire auditorium. It's quite foul. Um, it's, it's awful. So but it's actually a really handy thing that we have such a low threshold for this specific uh, smell in general or this particular odorant uh, because it's used as an additive for natural gases. Um, and so because natural gas um, is a colorless and odorless uh, and potentially explosive um, and potentially lethal gas, but it's used a lot of times for heating and cooking. So what people do, what the gas company does essentially, is they'll add a little bit of methyl mercaptan um, to our natural gas supply. And this is what gives you that kind of characteristic um, stink of like a, a gas leak so that you know that you should maybe leave your house and not light any matches, um, lest you risk, you know, a major explosion. So this is one of those times when a low odor threshold is a really great thing. Um, if you were to spill a bottle of it in an auditorium, on the other hand, that would be an unfortunate mistake. <laughs> very, very, very stinky. So adaptation um, to odors is also going to occur fairly rapidly. This is a very rapidly adapting um, special sense. And uh, olfactory receptors are olfactory receptors are going to adapt by about 50% within the first second or so um, after stimulation, but are going to adapt relatively slowly after that. So it's going to be a, a, a quick drop off as far as how rapidly they're adapting, but then after about half, after about a second or so, it's going to be a much slower um, adapt, adaptation. So. so that's really all we have to cover for, um, for, the, sense of ol for the special sense for olfaction. The next of the special senses that we're going to discuss is, is for taste. So this is also called gustation or the sense of taste. This is also a chemical sense, but it's a good bit simpler than olfaction. Um, there are only five primary tastes. We have sour that's produced by hydrogen ions that are released from acids. So the more acidic a food, the more acidic a food is, the more um, sour it's going to taste. Um, we also have sweet. Uh, this is elicited by sugars such as glucose, fructose, sucrose, etc. And then by artificial sweeteners like saccharins or aspartames or sucralose. Um, I don't personally like these. I think they taste gross. Um, but some people like them just fine. These are going to have bind to the same sort of receptors um, that, would, that would bind to those uh, sweet, those sugar flavors. Um, our third type of uh, primary taste is bitter, and this is going to be caused by a wide variety of substances, um, things like caffeine, morphine, quinine, um, all of these are going to have a, a bitter um, <clears throat> kind of taste. Um, this is thought to be because um, many of the poisonous substances um, that are evolved naturally in nature are also going to have bitter tastes, um, so maybe as an evolutionary evolutionarily protective sort of mechanism for, for plants um, to have this sort of bitter taste um, to ward off anything from eating them um, that in, in the thought that they might be poisonous because they have this bitter taste. Although coffee is, you know, caffeine is not poisonous in and of itself. Um, but anyhow, uh, salt, the, the taste of salt is due to the presence of sodium, sodium ions. And then this one is kind of a fun one is umami. This is a meaty or a savory kind of flavor. Um, and this is elicited by amino acids, especially glutamate, um, that are going to be present in food. So if you've ever been to like a restaurant and they add MSG um, to, your flu to your food, it's going to really help to enhance that kind of meaty, savory flavor because MSG is monosodium glutamate. Um, and so it's going to help to kind of enhance that umami sort of flavor. Um, other flavors, things like chocolate or pepper or coffee or whatever, are going to be some kind of combination of the five primary tastes, of the five primary tastes, excuse me. So plus any kind of accompanying olfactory or tactile or thermal sensation that's going to go with that. So if something has capsaicin in it, it's going to activate the thermal sensation um, and it's going to make you think that it's spicy in addition to whatever, um, uh, whatever of those primary tastes you're also experiencing. So my favorite thing to think about when we're thinking about sensations, of, um, specifically gustation, is how really complicated flavors can come about. So my favorite example is curry, you know, which has a lot of different 
flavors going on in one thing. It's a little bit of sweet, a little bit of savory, kind of salty. It's doing a lot of different things. But your brain is able to recognize that pattern of this particular combination of, of flavors as something that tastes like curry or spaghetti sauce or whatever it is you want to talk about. Um, it's, it's this recognition of um, these, this, this pattern of these flavors that's going to give it that distinct taste. So um, we've all heard about taste buds. These are going, taste buds are going to be responsible for containing the receptors for the sensation of taste. There are approximately 10,000 taste buds that are found on the adult tongue um, or on the tongue of a ad young adult, um, as well as in the soft palate, the pharynx, and the epiglottis. As you age, um, this, this number of taste buds is going to go down. Uh, this is maybe why your grandparents maybe like to oversalt their food or they like to add a lot of hot sauce. It's because they have lost a lot of their taste buds and so they have to really oversalt everything in order to get that same kind of flavor. Um, taste buds are going to contain three main types of epithelial cells. We have our supporting cells, our gustatory receptor cells, and our basal stem cells. This is going to be kind of a similar arrangement to what we had for our olfactory cells there. So looking at our types of cells in the taste bud. Each taste bud is an oval body that's going to consist of three kinds of epithelial cells, like we said. Our supporting cells, our gust gustatory receptor cells, and our basal cells. The supporting cells are going to be surrounded by about 50 or so of these gustatory receptor cells um, in each taste bud. These gustatory microvilli, or sometimes called gustatory hairs, are going to project out, which you can see up here, they're kind of cute, um, are, going to uh, are going to project out from each of the gustatory receptor cells to the external surface through a little taste pore. This is an opening in the taste bud. And then basal cells, or stem cells, that are found at the periphery of the taste bud, um, down here you can see, um, are going to, that are going to be found near the connective tissue layer. And these are going to produce supporting cells, which are then going to develop into gustatory receptor cells eventually. So it's a whole process. Each of the gustatory receptor cells has a lifespan of about 10 days. This is kind of a handy thing, uh, because if you ever burned your tongue, like, you know, when you take a bite of something that's too hot and you burn your tongue, you've kind of get, kind of killed or annihilated some of those taste buds, right? But because the lifespan of these things has a pretty short turnover, 10 days, you're not going to be too long. It's not going to be too long before you can taste things normally again, um, before your tongue recovers, basically. Uh, so at the, at the base of these taste buds, the gustatory receptor cells are going to synapse with dendrites of the first order neurons that are going to form the first part of our gustatory pathway. The dendrites of each of these first order neurons are then going to branch significantly and are going to contact a whole bunch of different gustatory receptor cells um, in several different taste buds. Uh, so taste buds are going to be located in elevations of the tongue called little papillae, um, which if you remember from previous lectures, papillae uh, means nipple in Latin. So if you ever need to be sexy in another language, you could say, you know, I like your papillae. But anyhow, um, so the, th the three types of papillae that contain taste buds are the villate papillae, fungiform, and foliate papillae. All right. So villate papillae are going to be about what? There are going to be about 12 of these, and they're going to contain about 100, or 100 to 300 um, of these taste buds. And you can see these guys back here. All right, our fungiform um, papillae are going to be scattered over the tongue, all over the tongue, and they're going to have about five taste buds each. And then, last but not least, are our foliate. Um, pa pa uh, excuse me, our foliate papillae, and these are going to be located in the lateral. Uh, trenches of the tongue, um, and these mostly are going to de the de excuse me the taste buds for most of these um, are going to degenerate early in childhood. Um, and sometimes is why little kids don't like certain foods, and then as they grow older, they actually like it better because some of these these taste buds have changed and they've um, they've they've moved or or degenerated in this case. So those are our three types of papillae that contain taste buds. We also have um, a third type of papillae called filiform papillae. And these are going to cover the entire surface of the, skin, of the tongue. And they are going to contain tactile receptors, um, but no taste buds. 
So these are really great for increasing the friction um, to make it easier for the tongue to move food around in the mouth, but they're, they don't play any kind of role in actual, actually tasting anything. <clears throat> so looking at the physiology of gustation, uh, chemicals that stimulate the gustatory receptor cells are called tastins, just like we had odorants for olfaction, we have tastins for gustation. Um, so once a tastin is dissolved in saliva, it's able to make contact with the plasma membrane of our little gustatory microvilli. Um, and these, this is where we're going to have the site for taste transduction. The result is, of this taste transduction is going to be a depolarizing receptor potential that stimulates the exocytosis of synaptic vesicles from our little gustatory receptor cells. Then a, the neurotransmitter molecule is going to trigger a graded potential that is then going to produce a nerve impulse in our first order sensory neurons that synapses with our gustatory receptor cells. So because we have all of these five, um, these five different primary flavors or tastes, um, the receptor potentials are going to arise differently from different types of tastants. The sodium ions that are in a salty food are going to enter the gustatory receptors via a sodium channel that's found in the plasma membrane. And then this accumulation of sodium ions is going to, um, that are inside that cell are going to cause a depolarization of that cell, which is then going to, to lead to the release of a neurotransmitter. Likewise, hydrogen ions in sour tastings um, are going to flow into the gustatory receptors via hydrogen channels. And again, this is going to result in the depolarization of that cell, and this is going to lead ultimately to the release of a neurotransmitter. However, other tastings, things that are like that are responsible for stimulating sweet, bitter, and umami tastes, are not themselves actually going to enter the gustatory receptors cells. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to bind to the receptors on that plasma membrane, and these receptors are going to be linked to a G protein, just like what we talked about with olfaction. This G protein, in turn, is going to activate an enzyme that's going to produce a secondary messenger called inositol triphosphate, or IP3. And then IP3 is in turn going to cause, or ultimately is going to cause, this depolarization of our gustatory receptor cells. And this is going to lead to the release of neurotransmitters, ultimately. So individual gustatory receptor cells are responsible for only one type of tastin. Right? But remember, there's multiple gustatory receptor cells in each taste bud. So anyhow, this, um, this is due largely to the fact that the membrane of a gustatory receptor cell is either going to have an ion channel or a sep or, or, or excuse me, it's either going to have an ion channel or a receptor for one of the primary tastes. So for example, a gustatory receptor that is responsible for detecting bitter tastings is only going to have receptors for those tastings, and they're not going to be able to detect sweet or sour or salty um, tastings, etc. They don't have the appropriate receptors or ion channels. Therefore, each gustatory receptor cell is going to be tuned, if you will, to detect a specific primary tastin. And this uh, segregation, or like kind of uniqueness of it, is going to be important for maintaining a specific, um, uh, is going to be important for maintaining a specific taste information like profile that's going to be relayed to the brain in a specific way. So it's also important to mention that a given taste bud is also going to contain gustatory receptors for each of the different types of tastings, allowing the primary tastes to be detected on all parts of the tongue. So what you maybe heard when you were in grade school, um, elementary school, that you only taste salty in like the side of your tongue or the front of your tongue or whatever, um, or you only taste sour on the left back side, um, that's actually not accurate. You can detect all of the five primary tastings um, at all parts of the tongue. But they are, but each individual gustatory receptor cell is specifically tuned for one specific tastin. It's just that each taste bud has multiple gustatory receptor cells that are tuned for all of the different primary tastes. So that's kind of an interesting little side note. It's a misconception as a, chi as, as a child, perhaps. So looking at the threshold and adaptation for taste, um, the, th the threshold for taste is going to vary pretty significantly um, for each of the various primary tastings. The threshold for bitter substances is going to be the lowest, and this is because poisonous substances are often really bitter. 
Um, so you need a low threshold or a high sensitivity in order to be able to detect even small amounts of poisonous things so that there's a protective function there. The threshold for sour substances is also going to be measured by using hydrochloric acid, and this is going to be a little bit higher um, than what we would see in bitter. Um, and then the thresholds for salty and sweet substances are going to be similar, and they are going to be higher than those of both bitter and sour substances. So it just the threshold is, is good. The, how sensitive something is, the threshold, is going to depend on the kind of tasting that we're talking about. Um, so complete adaptation for a specific taste can take anywhere from one to five minutes of continuous stimulation. Um, this is why maybe if you're eating a piece of gum, chewing on a piece of gum, it loses its flavor fairly quickly. It's maybe just because um, there's been, uh, you know, some adaptation that's occurred there. So taste adaptation is going to um, is due to changes that are going to occur as those taste receptors and olfactory and excuse me. Taste adaptation is due to changes that are going to occur in the taste receptors in those olfactory receptors um, and in the neurons of the gustatory pathway in the central nervous system. Um, so looking at the pathway for the gustatory system, um, there are going to be three main cranial nerves that are involved in the sense of taste. Um, we have our facial nerve, um, which is nerve uh, seven. And this is going to carry information from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, um, this, right, right, this part, um, our anterior two-thirds of the tongue up to the brain. Um, and then we have our glossopharyngeal nerve, um, which is nerve uh, nine. And this is going to carry information from the posterior one-third um, of the tongue right here, our glossopharyngeal nerve. And then last but not least, we have the vagus nerve. And this is going to carry information or taste information from the taste buds that are found on the epiglottis and in the throat. Um, so those are our, our three cranial nerves <clears throat> that are involved in the sensation of taste. So looking again at our taste or our gustatory pathway, from those taste buds, the nerve impulse is going to propagate along these cranial nerves, those three cranial nerves, to the gustatory nucleus um, that's found in the medulla oblongata. And then from the medulla, some axons are going to carry taste signals um, that carry, excuse me, some axons that carry taste signals are going to project to the limbic system and to the hypothalamus, and others are going to go straight to the thalamus. The taste signals that project from the thalamus are, um, are going to move then to the gustatory, uh, the primary gustatory area that's found in the insula of the cerebral cortex. And this is going to give rise to the conscious perception of taste, and also as well as the being able to discriminate between different taste sensations. This is how we tell the difference between a curry and, you know, a chocolate ice cream. So that's, uh, that's how that's all kind of processed and understood. So that is all that we have for the information covering the olfactory and gustatory systems. Um, we will talk about vision and um, equilibrium and hearing in the next couple of, of recordings.